A recent issue in the property market is what happens when tenants stop paying their rent, and what, if anything, can landlords do about this? This has become a significant concern with regulations being passed through various state legislatures in various locations. Now, some of these regulations haven't been finalized, so it's important to bear in mind they're still subject to change. But I'll cover, broadly speaking, what these regulations might involve and some of the issues that might come up with these regulations. Now, before we get there, it would be great if you click the like and subscribe buttons. And also, if you have any thoughts on this matter, drop a comment below. Now, in terms of tenancies, we need to first think about what exactly is a tenancy, because there's a lot of misinformation that's floating out there. In particular, I've seen comments that a tenancy involves the landlord having a claim on the income of the tenant. That's patently false. A tenancy is a property right. It gives the tenant the right to live in that property, as the case might be. Now, the tenancy can relate to a residential tenancy, commercial, or just various other things. I'm going to be focusing primarily on residential, but the broad topics relate similarly between residential and commercial. So we'll give that property right to reside in that property. Now, broadly speaking, that means that the landlord can't go in and kick out that tenant without cause. Those causes are generally specified within the tenancy agreement. Importantly here, that agreement is a contract. The contract involves the tenant paying rent to the landlord in return for services. Other things can be specified. That service is generally the provision of the property. Occasionally, we'll specify the provision of uh, perhaps supplies or perhaps utilities. So, for example, the landlord might pay electricity, gas, etc., etc. It's going to depend a lot on the nature of that contract, but it is a contract. So if one of the two parties breaches that contract, it can potentially enable the other party to simply tear it up and leave, depending on how it's being specified. So, for example, if the tenant fails to pay rent, then the landlord can evict that tenant because that tenancy contract is a claim on the money, is not a claim on the tenant's income. That's important to specify because the tenancy is not conditional on the tenant having an income and is not conditional on the tenant being employed. A tenant can be unemployed. They might have a lot of cash. They might be retired. They might have other ways of paying their rent. So it's not a claim on the tenant's assets per se. It's an entitlement to a rental income stream. Now, that's important to stress because if the tenant becomes unemployed in ordinary circumstances, that doesn't mean the tenant can avoid rent. That would only be the case if regulations step in to allow that to be the case. So that brings us to regulations. So what regulations have broadly been discussed? Well, in broad terms across Australia, we've got the regulation where landlords are not going to be able to evict tenants for generally speaking six months if that tenant fails to pay rent. Now, of course, there can be nuances here and there, but that's broadly speaking what the regulations being brought in have entailed. So that's the broad baseline regulation. But there are some other regulations that have been layered on top of this that can create major problems. So, for example, one of the regulations considered in Victoria is to stop uh, inspections of the properties. So they would stop physical inspections while the tenant is residing in that property. That would generally be a breach and a variation to the tenancy agreements, because ordinarily a tenancy agreement will make that tenant have to provide access for the purpose of enabling inspections for someone else to buy the property or to lease out the property or whatever the case might be. So access has to be provided in various circumstances. So Victoria stepping in would involve a variation of that tenancy agreement. We can see similar types of things being discussed in Queensland as well, which would effectively, of course, enable the tenants to avoid paying rent and avoid being evicted, potentially therefore forcing that landlord to provide free accommodation to the tenant. Now, there isn't really an on-flow compensation to the landlord because that landlord is going to have difficulties recouping some of that rent, particularly if the tenant doesn't pay rent for six months and then fails to be able to recoup it. Furthermore, the landlord isn't really going to be relieved of his or her mortgage requirements and the landlord isn't going to have retirement income provided for if they're relying on rental income for retirement. So effectively, the landlord is bearing the cost of this arrangement. Now, importantly, many of these regulations, when they're saying that the tenant can't be evicted for non-paying rent, there's nuances here. So for example, at one point in time, Queensland has been discussing not even requiring the tenant to prove a loss of income. The tenant can simply stop paying rent. Now, they wouldn't need to prove that they've lost income. They wouldn't need to prove they're unemployed. They wouldn't need to prove any financial situation. So in that case, there wouldn't be a financial hardship aspect of it even. It would simply be that the tenant could simply refuse to pay rent. 
Now, Queensland appears to be backing off that, requiring some form of conciliation in which the tenant would need to provide some form of statement of financial position. Nevertheless, it started off in that quite deleterious position for the landlord. So that, broadly speaking, is what the regulations involve. New South Wales has been considering various things along the lines of, say, reducing or removing land tax. Now, of course, the nuances are being worked out, but that's been one factor under consideration, which clearly makes sense if you're considering the fact that the landlord is being forced to have no rental income, clearly it's not really sensible to have them paying land tax on it as well. All right, so that broadly speaking is what the regulations are. In short, they basically involve pauses on rent payments and it might be without any recourse to the landlord. Now, one thing that's important to note before we move on is that these pauses to rent payments, it doesn't per se mean the tenant can't pay rent. The tenant might need to pay back rent at some point in time. The tenant would typically remain liable for the rent they haven't paid. Now, again, the nuances are going to vary, but that could in theory mean the landlord could just take the unpaid rent from the bond that the tenant has. Now, that's not adequate because if the bond destroys the place, or if the tenant destroys the place, the bond is there to cover that. So it isn't really perfect, but the landlord could still take some of that money. Now, that is eminently sensible. One thing that hasn't been properly resolved is how the landlord would recoup unpaid rent after the period of rent relief. Now, exactly how that would operate hasn't been made clear at this point. It might involve the landlord needing to go to small claims court to get that money back. The question is, what's the problem with them? Well, the main problem is they're shifting the cost from the tenant onto the landlord, and there's a few major issues that arise. The first issue, which hasn't been worked out in all jurisdictions, is sometimes the tenant might simply stop paying rent without proving financial loss or a loss of income on their part. That clearly exposes the landlord to a significant potential cost, because then all tenants could simply stop and use that as a free option. So that's a huge issue that needs to be worked out. As I've indicated, Queensland appears to be trying to work this out, but it's obviously not perfect at this point in time. The second major issue is the landlord still needs to pay a mortgage. Now, many banks are enabling a degree of mortgage relief. What that involves is pausing the mortgage payments, but any interest that would accrue is then capitalized. So if there's any unpaid interest, that then is added to the balance of the property's mortgage. Basically, the landlord is bearing the cost of the interest they would otherwise have been able to pay. So the landlord could still end up many tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket by virtue of this tenant not paying rent. So the landlord pays a significant cost there. Thirdly, depending on the state and how it's worked out, the landlord could still have to pay land tax. Now, of course, that might be relieved in some circumstances, but clearly if the landlord isn't getting a rental income, then land tax makes no sense. So that's another issue that comes up there. So you've got those major issues that effectively mean the landlord ends up paying the cost of any of these rent reliefs that go ahead. Banks might also incur a cost because they're not getting the income in right now. But from a bank's perspective, assuming they have liquidity, they're going to recoup all of the money they would otherwise have lost. From the landlord's perspective, it's much more difficult because they might not be able to recoup that rental income, but they will still have to pay all of the money back to the bank. Furthermore, we have to think about retirees. Some retirees rely on property for a retirement income. That's going to be their rental stream. So it's kind of like an alternative to superannuation. Now that's a huge problem. These retirees face a significant issue because if the retirees rely on that rental income and then the tenant stops paying, the retiree is without income. Now the retiree, if they're relying on rental property, often won't be entitled to the many seniors benefits. So often they won't be entitled to many of the pension type benefits because they'll have an investment property. So this retiree is then out of pocket and potentially unable to sustain themselves throughout this whole process. So many of the regulations being considered are palpably unfair toward landlords. There's a further claim that sometimes comes up and is a total red herring. The red herring is there's supposedly some moral or ethical responsibility toward tenants. That's not the case. This is simply a contractual arrangement between landlords and tenants, nothing more. It's a commercial contract effectively. Effectively, if someone breaches their contract, they can be taken to court for loss of bargain damages. Broadly speaking here then, if the tenant fails to pay their rent, they could be evicted, evicted rather, under ordinary circumstances. And that's ordinarily the recompense. A further red herring is it's sometimes mentioned that landlords expect their income to be without risk, and they expect to never have to face any risk of a lack of income. 
That also is patently false. Landlords bear the risk of vacancies. They bear the risk of fluctuating fees. They bear the risks of repairs occurring. So therefore, landlords aren't expecting uh, effectively no, uh, no risk because they bear that risk of vacancies. And a landlord, if they evicted the tenant, would risk that vacancy. So this then begs the question of what can a landlord do? Well, a landlord has to some extent his or her hands tied. The reason for that is if regulations prevent one evicting a tenant, it is difficult to do so. So therefore, you would be breaching a regulation of some kind if one were to go about evicting the tenant. So a landlord has limited recompense there. Now, the landlord is then left with really a couple of options. Firstly, he or she can rely on getting that rent back at the end of the rental period. Now, that's going to depend on regulations, but if one doesn't negotiate for a lower rental payment, then one could potentially just claim it back when that tenant is unable, is able rather, to pay that rent back. That's effectively going to result in a higher rent during subsequent periods, where that tenant will have to pay the money back. That would make sense as well, because then the landlord will get his or her money back and can potentially pay any payments that he or she couldn't make to the bank. The second thing the landlord could potentially do is the landlord could, of course, pause rental payments or pause mortgage payments, rather. That's going to enable the landlord to have some breathing room while he or she waits to get that rental money back from the tenant. So that's the second thing the landlord should potentially do. The third thing the landlord should do is the landlord should probably proactively talk to the tenant and outline the expectations in relation to rent payments. That means that the tenant would become well aware that the, uh, the rental payments are expected to be paid at some point in time. Fourthly, depending on how it's structured in the regulations, you could at least rely on the bond. If the landlord wanted to uh, perhaps recoup some of this foregone rent, the bond might enable them to do so. The landlord might also be able to take the tenant to small claims court if that is perhaps where it ends up. And therefore you'd need to go to court to get the rent that hasn't been paid. That of course is not ideal. Typically there might be some form of conciliation arrangement that might arise. But nevertheless, it's not the ideal situation. It would be better to just have the rent paid, which means that maintaining some degree of amicable, amicability would be somewhat useful in that arrangement in terms of getting the rent paid at some point. It's often easier as well if a rental manager becomes involved. So those are some of the things that the landlord might do. The landlord won't be able to evict the tenant. In some select circumstances, if the tenancy agreement involves the provision of utilities, so for example, provision of electricity, gas, etc., the landlord could certainly stop paying for those things. The reason for that is these uh, pauses on evictions are mainly just a pause on removing the tenant. However, it doesn't appear that one would still need to pay for utilities. So if the landlord were to stop doing this, then that would be within the landlord's rights, depending on how the regulation is being phrased. That could be one way for the landlord to save some costs. Of course, that comes at the risk of being able to get less rent back afterwards, but nevertheless, that's one way of going about doing it. But it's going to be very difficult to evict the tenant. Now, the question, of course, is whether it would be beneficial to evict the tenant. And that's a difficult one to answer, because it will depend upon how likely it is one could rent out that property. Anecdotally, there's a glut of properties on the market at quite low rents. So evicting a tenant at this point is probably going to be risky, and it could be difficult for that landlord to get a tenant back into the property. So obviously evictions are perhaps superficially attractive, but they could also impose their own costs. Now, once the lockdown ends, the evictions would be easier to do because it's going to be easier for people to get tenants into the property. But nevertheless, it's going to pose a problem for the time being. So that broadly speaking is what's happening in relation to the property market and some of the issues arising in relation to the rental relief and the eviction relief policies that are being brought in, and why, at the moment, they appear to be skewed against landlords and strongly in favour of tenants, which creates a significant problem for landlords and significant cost that needs to, be, uh, needs to be plugged. And it's why this cost is effectively just being shifted, which regulators appear not to have properly grasped and not properly grappled with. And landlords do have some tools to be able to recoup that rent, but nevertheless, it can be problematic. All right, so that's an overview of some of these regulations, some of the issues that landlords are currently facing in relation to perhaps property vacancies, but also the rent relief and eviction relief policies. Now, I hope this video has been informative to you. If it has, it would be great if you click the like and subscribe buttons. 
And if you have any thoughts on the matter, drop a comment below and I'd love to hear what you think on this issue. So thanks once again for tuning in and I hope to see you next time. Bye.